Hi, my name is Kathy Gao, and I'm curator of the Hatfield Historical Museum, located on the second floor of the Hatfield Public Library. We're open on Saturday and Tuesday morning, so please come visit us. The following program is titled The Great River, Art and Society of the Connecticut River Valley. It was presented by William Hosley uh, in the Hatfield Congregational Church in March. And about 85 people from all over the valley attended the program. And I got great positive reviews from people. Many people mentioned how it made them feel proud to live in the valley because of all the different things that he talked about that are, that are from here. And also they left with lists of places that they'd like to visit. If you miss the program then, or you'd like to see it again, uh, please stay with us. A few words about our presenter. Uh, Bill Hosley is the uh, principal of his own firm called Terra Firma Northeast. He's based in Enfield, Connecticut. He has been a museum director, a curator, and an exhibition developer, including for the exhibit at the Wadsworth Athenaeum on which this program is based, called The Great River, Art and Society of the Connecticut River Valley. Bill regaled us with stories of Connecticut River Valley treasures, including fine furniture, architectural details, gravestones, textiles, and more. Please join us in watching this program, which was presented by the Hatfield Historical Society and the Waitley Historical Society. If you're on Facebook, go to the Hatfield Historical Museum Facebook page and like us, and we hope you enjoy the show. Uh, despite all appearances, little tech problems here and there, I couldn't be more delighted than to be in Hatfield. I always love visiting Hatfield. I come here a lot when we were doing research for this exhibit years ago. Uh, it was the first time I saw your historical society. Yeah, I think my eyes almost fell out of my head. It's absolutely a nationally significant treasure you got here and all this history. I always say also that Hatfield is still the most sort of agrarian agriculture. You have real farms here. And farming and agriculture continue to be part of the Hatfield story. So in many ways, Hatfield is the quint quintessential river town. The only place I know that kind of compares to it is East Windsor Hill, Connecticut. It's worth a detour. But uh, you've just got a lovely history in Main Street, and that's, to me, the basis of it, what makes young people and people of all ages care about their community, an awareness of the journey and where things uh, come from. Kathy's doing a great job. She, I, we email back and forth from time to time. I, the last thing that popped in over the transom today, you'll love this, was a, a news story from a magazine about how the National Gallery in Washington and the Smithsonian are demanding seven million additional dollars uh, for their annual subsidy so that they can function. And uh, when you go there to Washington, they, have, they always like to tell you that they're free, but they're actually not free. They steal the money. They go around the back door and get it that way, and, and you don't even hear about it. So this is where history, and the Smithsonian's fine, but you got your own Smithsonian right here and in Waitley. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight, and that's, that's how we make it go. Uh, the, uh, the Connecticut Valley has been my work, my, my inspiration and muse since I was a teenager up north in Vermont, on the town near the town of Bellows Falls, and I fell in love with history. I'd grown up in uh, the Midwest or Mideast, somewhere out there near Ohio. And I, you know, we didn't have as much of this kind of stuff. And this was in the 70s, in you know, the bicentennial and everything. And I just thought the American Revolution in the 18th century was so fascinating. And then I had the privilege, I spent a summer, I was a student at historic Deerfield. And that was sort of the, the nail in the coffin. I think at that point I was pretty much, it was irreversible. I was going to do what I could to make... Uh, uh, a life in this business, and I've, I've loved every minute of it, and the incredible thing is you could spend five lifetimes here in the Connecticut Valley, and you still couldn't learn half of what there is to know, see half of what there is to see, or tap it all out, so it's, you know, it's a great joy, and, um, you know, this isn't new. In fact, ironically, a uh, hundred years ago, before tourism got all exotic, and, you know, all these these cruise ships and all this garbage that they're peddling all the time uh, takes us away from the thing that we most need to know, which is what are the simple, elegant, eloquent pleasures 
close to home. You don't need to spend a ton of money to be a tourist. You can literally be a tourist, if you will, in your own backyard. And a hundred years ago, there was abundant literature. As, uh, let me see if I got this quote from uh, William Cullen Bryant, who most of you will know because he grew up in Cummington and he had his wonderful, that's a great house up in Cummington. He wrote, and he was the most, the most famous literary man in America in the 1870s. There, Bryant Park next to the New York Public Library. This guy was a big deal. He was in publishing. He was sort of the Rupert Murdoch of his generation, you might say. He was a publishing tycoon, but also a kingmaker, you know, an editorialist, and a, a, a poet, and a great man. He, one of the, he, and he wrote in, in a book that he published in 1874 that the charms of the beautiful valley of the Connecticut have so often been described that all persons of intelligence in the country have some knowledge of its exceedingly varied and picturesque scenery. Thomas Cole, the famous artist of the Hudson River School, most famous early American artist, goes up to Mount Holyoke and paints the scene below, the farms, that kind of middle landscape, that sense of the, 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 the bucolic beauty, the balance, and the civic kind of I image that Americans cherished, this idea of a, a nation of yeoman farmers that were self-reliant and self-sustaining, and the Connecticut Valley seemed to epitomize all that. Then the Industrial Age came and things exploded economically, and you know, prior to the Civil War, most towns, even Hartford and Springfield, Oh, wait, maybe they were two to three times the size of Waitley and Hatfield, but they weren't 20 times the size. And suddenly in the industrial age, these towns, like Springfield and Hartford and Middletown and Greenfield, became little cities. And in the case of Hartford and Springfield, kind of big cities. So the world changed, but we're going to try to cover a lot of ground here. And I will, uh, these are just some of my little favorite things and images. And you get. The, uh, the map there, and the, the Great River Project, and I should just add, I was thrilled. This past month, a New York art publication came out with a, uh, uh, an article that identified the 100 greatest milestones in American art of the past 150 years, starting with the founding of George Washington's Mount Vernon in 1859, and this exhibit was listed on that 100 milestones, so I thought that was pretty cool. And, uh, and, and, and uh, so let's, let's take a look at some of this stuff. As I say, there, there is literature. I collect a lot of these things, and I, I think the national, it's been a while, and maybe that suggests something, but it, the National Geographic has run big feature stories on the Connecticut Valley, at least three and possibly four times. And you know that always signifies, you know, it's great when travel writers and people in the media pay attention. They, they haven't been doing that as much lately, but there are books, and in a sense, uh, the book that we produced was contributing to that literature. Now, this again is a map that shows, a couple maps that show uh, the region that we focused on. This, the research for this exhibit, we went to every public collection including next door, from Saybrook, Massachusetts to Claremont and Hanover, New Hampshire. And we photographed 7,000 objects and we spent countless hours in the probate courts in Hamden County, Hampshire County, Franklin County, Hartford County, and uh, doing research on how people lived and reading account books. And we spent days and days in the library at Historic Deerfield and at the Connecticut Historic. So we did a lot of, it was the most time-consuming research project in the history of the Athenaeum. It was also the biggest exhibition. So, so we focused on all this stuff. We also visited 140 private collections. And in those days, uh, and still a little bit, but there were people around that were old timers that had stuff in their houses. And we were so scrupulous about their security that I actually lost the code that it would tell me when, when, when our little research cards say PC number 34, private collection number 34, well, that meant something once, but I seem to have lost the code. So we have the information and we kept gathering it. And this was the exhibition and just to amuse you tonight, I actually brought this book, which has been out of print since the 80s, 
at one point sold for $550 because on the secondary market. But the internet's made it easier to find things. The price has come down a little bit. And I brought two copies tonight. And anyone that wants one for 60 bucks, you can take it. Uh, but first come, first served. And then there is, uh, that was the brochure and the cover art for the exhibit. So, and uh, this was the exhibit itself. I mean, we, again, we had 550 objects, 90 lenders. Uh, historic Deerfield was an important one, but we also borrowed things from the Hatfield Historical Society. And what I, again, what I loved is we had, again, lenders as big as the Metropolitan Museum of Art and as small as the Northfield, Massachusetts Public Library. And when we finally, after sorting through thousands of objects, had to pick the things that would tell the story, uh, the, the, that's, we got right down to that point where, where, you know, even, again, the Northfield, that was probably our smallest lender, but there are great things everywhere. And this was the exhibit, and it was, again, a multi, this was sort of the high watermark of what I call the decorative arts movement, when museum people were really focused on antiques and furniture and pottery. And I think that we're, the, 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 the analysis of cultural material, as I describe it, the stuff is really a better word, that tell the story of our human experience has evolved a little bit, I think, from the decorative arts era. But this is was the high watermark of it in the 80s, 70s, and 80s. And so it was a kind of a decorative art show. We had furniture and silver and ceramics and clothes and paintings and you know all kinds of th things. And it was really, the reason it made this list of the top 100 is because it was the first exhibition ever mounted in this country that was multi, multimedia in a sense. There'd been exhibits of Rhode Island furniture and different things, but scrambling it all up, we had everything from ironwork, and we had a bear trap from Northampton uh, on display. We had textiles, paintings, architecture, photographs of gravestones. So it was a multi interdisciplinary multimedia approach that looked at a place. And that was the emphasis. And the place, of course, was this place. And you can see some of the layout, some of these things like this photograph uh, upper right there uh, of a Connecticut, that's actually a house, the Connecticut Valley doorway of a house in South Windsor, Connecticut. But you know, some of these things we blew up real big. That was expensive to do, but it dramatized the subject. And here are photographs of gravestones. But you know, really, really great things. And again, the fundamental idea is that before this global age where you know, everything in our lives today, the things, the clothes we wear, the food we eat, everything is imported. In those days, almost nothing was imported. They imported some ceramics and and, and, and a few things, but most of the things in everyday life, the things, the houses they built, the clothes they wore, the furniture that they used were things that were made by local craftsmen and artisans using local materials. Sort of an astonishing difference, really, from then and now. And because of that, places, the, 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 the furniture, the architecture, the material evidence is different from one place to the next. So you can actually map where you are with objects. You can tell where you are visually if you know the language. It's kind of like learning, learning a foreign language. And a lot of people turned out, and it was really great fun. And it was up for, uh, uh, again, from uh, September to uh, the end of the year in uh, 1985. And then everything went back. So let's give you a little lowdown on some of this stuff. The, you know, the, these towns, I forget, was Hatfield 1651? What? 1670? Okay, so a little bit later. Uh, the earliest towns in the Connecticut Valley were founded in the 1630s. And we have nothing to show for that because they lived fairly primitively and there weren't many people and things during King Philip's war and other times, things got burned or lost or destroyed. So there's almost no objects. There are some archival records and documents. There are almost no objects that predate 1650 that we can point to. But around that time, 1660s or so, you begin to get stuff and you begin to get things that we can point to. And these chests, both of which are from Windsor, Connecticut, one of the three original river towns, this one at Wadsworth Athenaeum and this one at Memorial Hall in Deerfield, uh, reflect a sort of British imported 
stylistic, the, the way things were made in old England. So they're here, but they haven't really adapted to their environment quite yet, and they're still making things in the old country way. But that did change, and part of the drama of the Connecticut River Valley story is it changed here early. Uh, the, this, these uh, six-board chests, so-called, with the uh, uh, sort of dramatic uh, molded horizontal moldings there, and then in this case, punch decoration and little uh, engraved roundels or mandalas, whatever you want to call them, often with initials. That's Samuel Porter from Hadley. This is actually at the Porter Phelps Huntington Museum. And this HT, Henry Treat from Weathersfield, and it's actually dated 1673. 1673, excuse me, one, yeah, 1673. It's one of the only objects, and it's the earliest dated piece of Connecticut Valley furniture, and one of the very few objects that has come down to us with that kind of reliable date line from before King Philip's War, which, you know, destroyed a lot of stuff. So, uh, and, and then in the, after King Philip's War and the rebuilding of Springfield and all these towns that were damaged, uh, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of new construction, new buildings being built and new furniture being made, and it's in the 1680s and 90s that there, this, the, 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 that, that there emerges this tradition of uh, a flower and vine carved decorated uh, chests and cupboards and boxes known as the so-called Hadley chests, uh, uh, a, a name coined by a Hartford, Connecticut collector who was the first person to discover them and publicize them back in the 1870s. And I think this is supposed to be the Hatfield type. I mean, they made these right here. Uh, they made them in Hadley. They made them in Northampton. They made them in Enfield, Suffield. Uh, and there is sort of a variant known as the sunflower chest that was made in Weathersfield. And the fundamental characteristic of these things is these explosions of flowers. They, you know, they liked, it was sort of the medieval period, they had a lot of these sort of abstracted, naturalistic ornament based on flowers and things in nature <clears throat> that they would exaggerate. And you can do a little or you can do a lot. And they liked to just pour it on here. I think they were probably combating some kind of psychic depression or something. And, and they, they, you know, because it was lonely out here in the backwoods. And so if you had a lot of flowers to look at in the middle of winter, you know, it would cheer you up. And when I say it was lonely here in the backwoods, consider that at the time of King Philip's War and at the time of the, uh, 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 when they cut Charles I's head off, you know, over in England, uh, the uh, regicides, they were called, the people that killed the king when the restoration occurred in the uh, later 17th century, they hightailed it out of here. And if you wanted to be in the British Empire, but as far away from the center of it as you could po possibly be in 1675, Hadley was pretty much the end of the, the line. And that's that whole, the whole story of the angel of Hadley that I'm sure you all know uh, is based on that, that these regicides, some of them were in New Haven, but they hightailed it up here and, the, and that. So they, you know, it was, it was the backwoods. Now these flowers, these exaggerated flowers, we don't know, the neat thing about furniture is that it survives. The 17th century architecture we do not really have. We have little bits and pieces and ev evidence. Uh, this is a panel. We don't know what happened to the rest of this uh, sunflower cupboard. But this architectural fragment is one of the most, this is the kind of thing you might find in the Hatfield Historical Society. I didn't. But it's the kind of thing that small community-based historical societies sometimes wind up preserving and not it, it, they, and they're amazing, these kinds of little, this happened to be privately owned, but this is all that is left of the house built by Jonathan Ellsworth of about 1710 in Windsor, Connecticut. And when that house was demolished in the late 18th century, somebody in the family thought, you know, it's, that's kind of a neat little detail. I think we'll save it before we burn everything else or whatever they did with it. And there it is, the same ornamental tradition. So you sometimes see bits of that in architecture and uh, and of course, the Hadley chest, the, the, the tulip and stem, the, you know, the flower and vine element that is so iconic. And, you know, the, there's great simplicity to this. Um, it, you know, there's a repetition of pattern. The whole surface, this is a chest with three drawers. There aren't many of those at Memorial Hall in Deerfield. 
uh, this is also at Memorial Hall in Deerfield, but you can see that the, these patterns, and they vary a little bit. You get a little curly cue there. It's a little different from, I don't know what that is, a little pine tree. But basically the template, maybe even the silhouettes and patterns that they used were pretty repetitious, uh, and that's how they got the effect. And this was something completely new in the history of world furniture. There's no British or European source for this. Th this was something that craftsmen living on the frontier here made it up. They came up with this idea and they used, of course, local materials. And this, to me, is really the beginning of the story of American art. When, when people rooted in the environment of the new world begin breaking out of the old world mold and coming up with innovative new stuff. And these are really great. Uh, and in the 1720s, you know, moving on, uh, they, they, they began uh, introducing furniture that was decorated with paint and ornamental paint treatments. These are actually happened to be from Saybrook, Connecticut. So not every town did everything that was done in the Connecticut Valley, but you, but a lot of the things that we're seeing here were, you won't find anywhere else. The other wonderful characteristic about the work here, uh, the, 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 the short version is that in the New World, labor was expensive and raw materials were cheap. Uh, so they tended to be very, that's why these Hadley chests, even though they're very decorative, it's simple. You don't have to be Michelangelo to do that kind of work. You know, it's not that complex. And they slathered it up, but it was, I don't think they spent as much time as some of the joiners in England spent carving their uh, furniture masterpiece at the same time. Then when you look at the interiors or the backs or the drawers, you see these things are built like tanks. I mean, they're really heavy. That's like a inch and a quarter thick drawer stock. So it's, and then the back of the Hadley chest always have these big, thick, juicy chunks of pine that they would bevel the edge and then nail it to the back there. And they're, they're just, you know, they're great. And, uh, uh, and they, they have very distinctive qualities. Then in the 1740s, they introduced cabinet work. That was joinery. Joinery is panel and framework construction. Cabinet work is uh, board construction and has different features, characteristics, and very different stylistic features. You've got, it's the kind of Baroque idea, the kind of upward vertical thrust, the emphasis on curved lines. You don't have any of that, or you don't have much of that fancy carving. Some of them, like this one from Weathersfield, Connecticut, are rather simple and unadorned. Some have uh, scroll tops, like the Connecticut Valley doorways. Some have these uh, decorative uh, carved shells. Almost all of them use cherry wood as a hardwood, not mahogany, not maple, but cherry. So that was an indigenous feature. And some of them do retain, these are, those are high chests, these are desks and bookcases. Some of them do retain the, um, that, that tradition of the kind of fl flowers and floral carving that we saw on the, um, uh, the uh, Hadley chests and sunflower chests. And uh, this, is, um, uh, this is from Northampton. And this is, uh, I guess, from Springfield, Massachusetts. So these, and they, well, the, the distinguishing feature here are these deep carved shells and, and little feet, and then the, the carved uh, 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 floral ornament on the, 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 uh, the pilasters, as they call them, the little columns on the side. And, and, and the, these are some, you know, again, some wonderful uh, treasures here. This is, um, these are chests on chests uh, from, uh, um, Weathersfield on the left, and boy, I better get this right. What I'm here is this. Anne, help me out. Is this this is your this is an historic Deerfield? Is that from Conway? Uh, what? Yeah. Conway? I think so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so again, these are. Uh, and this is amazing because it's got sort of a double pediment and all the bells and whistles. And, and I should add, Historic Deerfield recently opened. The right house, that brick house at the north end of the street, has this just phenomenal state-of-the-art furniture display now that is the best thing I've ever seen on this topic. So you go there, you'll learn more than from, from me. The, uh, the most famous thing of this era that was produced here are these scallop top tables. And we've already discovered that in the 17th century, they had this mindset that if flowers are good, lots of flowers are better. 
And so if curves are good, they'd heard somewhere that the curved line of beauty was the essence of styling, you know. So lots of curves are going to be lots better. And nowhere else in America did anyone do this. This idea of a, the top has all these curves in multiple dimensions. And they're just, you know, and look, for people that are interested in this kind of thing, that's at, down at the museum in Delaware, Winter Tour Museum, that's probably a quarter of a million dollar object. You know, because it's just got everything going for it, and it's it's amazing. The chairs. Most people lived in relatively. They didn't. Most people did not have all that expensive stuff, even here. Uh, and most of the chairs in people's houses looked like this. They were turned chairs. They were relatively inexpensive. They were simple to make, but that did not prevent them from having features that are as distinctive as a thumbprint and traceable to this part of the world. And I love these little hearts. And this is a kind of a fun one that's got features of what you might call William and Mary, Queen Anne, and Chippendale. They kind of, they kind of, you know, more is more, and they weren't sure what period or fashion they wanted to follow, so they gave something for everyone. And then, and then this great Queen Anne chair from uh, Weathersfield with upholstery is uh, also, again, from this region. So, you, you know, as we move things, then, then the most famous furniture maker in the Connecticut Valley ever, and a couple years ago there was an entire book and a big book and an exhibition all about this guy, Lefelet Chapin. And the Chapins were mostly from, you know, Springfield, Chicopee, this part of the world. But this guy and his generation moved down to East Windsor Hill, East Windsor, Connecticut, and he uh, spent some time in Philadelphia learning what they did down here. And then he comes back and he translates the Philadelphia approach. Philadelphia then being the second largest English-speaking city in the world and the largest city in America, he, they, he, and the most, the richest, the biggest, everything. He comes back to the Connecticut Valley and translates the Philadelphia style into local materials and a local approach. People up here, did, you know, they liked lots of flowers and this and that, but there, there are certain aspects of the Philadelphia uh, furniture that is just a little too conspicuous consumption, a little too over the top, and probably a little too expensive. So they, he simplifies it a little bit, again, moving from mahogany to cherry, and these are examples of his work. This is in what might be called the Chippendale style. Then in the federal period, uh, they begin getting book knowledge, and they begin importing uh, pattern books from England, and so there's the beginning, around 1800, of the influence of, you know, uh, fashion ideas from outside. And I, I, to me, part of the beauty of this story is that the local stuff is locally invented. They're not stealing ideas from the, the Brits or from New York or Philadelphia, but that changes. And the, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, and these are some examples. These are uh, chairs of that federal period. This one belonged to Chief Justice Oliver Ellsworth, whose house, the DAR, operates in Windsor. It's most excellent. And you can see that, again, this is the so-called federal or neoclassical style. Uh, the exhibit featured clocks. You gotta love clocks. And uh, I know, I, I guess I'm coming up. They're doing an event in a couple weeks in Deerfield where they're going to have a talk on this subject and also be unveiling their new, they just bought Asa Stebbins' clock. And if you know historic Deerfield, you'll know that Asa Stebbins lived in that really cool brick house. And so they got his clock back. So that's pretty cool. And But we had some really great clocks. And this, including the Doolittles, you know, the uh, Isaac and Enos Doolittle were kind of the Sort of like the story of Paul Revere, but it's out here in the West. A guy who was, did everything. He made clocks. He had a bell foundry. He made silver. He was kind of entrepreneurial. Uh, uh, a member of the family was a printmaker. The Doolittles were, you know, they really deserve a whole book because they were kind of mechanical geniuses. And this clock was by Enos Doolittle, in, made in Hartford. Uh, again, about 1785, 1790. The region was famous for pewter and metal smithing. And the, again, these are all documented objects produced in the region uh, during the 18th and, and uh, I guess in the case of that copper teapot there, early, early 19th century. And, um, and, uh, and they're, they're great. The, uh, let me just see. Um, Yes, uh, Thomas and Samuel Danforth uh, down in the Middletown area 
were uh, Peter Smith's Abiel Pease from Enfield made this sword. And again, we were very ecumenical. Uh, we, we were interested in showing any kind, of, every kind of thing that was made here. I personally think iron is really cool. I'm always looking at door latches and things that you can find. And even in that, you, that is a trade that you would think was so pro prosaic and basic in a sense that, that, w that the idea of decoration and style wouldn't come into it much. But look at these. This is a church door latch to a church down in East Haddam. There's a lot going on there that you don't need to open the door. It's more about, you know, fashion statement. These are little meat skewers for part of the cooking that they did, and this is another. And again, that sort of exaggerated uh, sense of uh, curved lines and, you know, sort of adding additive features that you don't always see in everything is great. Uh, pottery, uh, Waitley, of course, was famous as a pottery center. I think this is maybe the least well-known, the least studied feature of the material culture of the Connecticut Valley. We, we know a lot more uh, through the documents than that we do from the objects. There is not as much 18th century stuff, but we do know there were potters in every, not, maybe not in every town, but almost every town. This happens to be some of the stuff that was made actually in, by the Goodwin uh, brothers. They were in the Seymours in uh, Hartford and West Hartford. That is a style of Connecticut Valley uh, pottery that again happens to be documented. A lot of this stuff is not. Textiles and clothing. Uh, Abigail Talcott, a lot of the women, of course, they did uh, needlework and they would make bed hangings and some of the cruel embroidery that you see is phenomenal. That dress, which is at the Porter Phelps Huntington Museum, is, uh, was made for Elizabeth Pitkin Porter's wedding in 1742. It's one of the most important articles of fashion from that period that has come down to us anywhere in the country. It's certainly was one of the great treasures that we made. And this is a swatch of the woolen material that was produced in the Hartford Woolen Works, one of the first factories actually in the Connecticut Valley in 1789. And George Washington was inaugurated in a suit made of this Connecticut Valley woolen because it was a political statement. They wanted to promote buy local and they had trouble finding any local, so they came up here. And uh, In terms of one of, the, one of the social stories that also plays out in art here is that um, the, um, you know, this isn't the South. Like up here, we kind of believe in public education, or at least we, we did early on, you know, and I think that, you know, and, and we believed actually, this seems like revolutionary, right? That we believe that like women should even be educated. Uh, heaven, heaven forbid, right? Well, fabulous. And it's not an accident that when you think of Mount Holyoke and Smith College and these institutions of higher learning, iconic women's education, that that's here in the Connecticut Valley because there was a tradition going back to the 18th century of these female academies and I think Kathy will know better than I but I think you had one right here in Hatfield this is something in the and the, again they they learned everything they learned math and literature and lots they, but the stuff that has survived from the, their education t tend to be the artworks that these girls did and these represent some of the Again, the female academies and the artwork. Uh, there was a book done recently, a couple years ago, on Connecticut River Valley samplers, which is a pretty cool topic. And again, more textiles, the bed rugs, these big uh, uh, embroidered coverlets. And you've seen the cruel, uh, you know, the woolen embroidered bed hangings. Well, sometimes they made entire articles of clothing out of uh, this kind of stuff. So. Uh, that's uh, more of it. Uh, we also in the exhibit f uh, focused on printing, publishing, and uh, the emergence of this concept of cultural nationalism. And what I mean by that is that after the revolution, the Americans sort of had this little anxiety attack because like now we're a new nation, we got a constitution, but like what does it mean to be American? We shouldn't be doing things Britishly anymore. We should have American stuff. We should have our American language and our American art and our American architecture. So for about 25 years, there was this almost, fra almost frantic campaign to introduce and to Americanize some of the basic conventions of daily life. And one of the most famous 
evangelists of the cultural nationalism, as I like to call it, was No Webster. And he did a lot more than come up with the first American dictionary. He also was a education theorist. He also was a journalist, uh, a, a one of the great towering intellectual figures of the early national period and one of our founding fathers. He was lived in Amherst for many years. He was born in West Hartford. He spent most of his adult life in New Haven. So he's, you know, kind of one of our guys. Asher Benjamin, uh, who um, lived in Greenfield for a while and then moved up north to Windsor, Vermont, started out in Suffield, uh, did some, his very earliest work there and then in Hartford and then he worked briefly uh, in Springfield and Northampton. So his whole launch, this is one of the most famous figures in, in, in early American architecture and the first American to produce uh, books, pattern books of architecture and somebody who was ad also addressing that issue of cultural nationalism uh, right here starting out in the Connecticut Valley and then the very first American cookbook was also produced here in the Connecticut Valley. So there's all this literary uh, stuff going on that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, so again, again, the exhibit, one of the things I was proud of with this, and I remember having kind of an argument with my boss at the time, who was sort of like real fundamentalist, and he thought that art museums don't show pictures of art. They show art, all right? How do we represent architecture and gravestones? Well, I don't know, all right? How about if we take pictures of them and include them? Would that be okay? Well, all right, so we did. And you know, that's what you gotta do. And the gravestones, to me, are the most incredible evidence, so you just can't leave that out. And you certainly don't wanna leave architecture out. People liked it, I think seeing the furniture and the architecture and the physical settings, and we had maps and stuff, and the architectural story, to me, this is how I got into this racket, was that I just liked initially cruising around on my bicycle looking at old houses, and then I got a car and I keep doing it. But uh, architecture is the great gift that we have. And your main street here in Hatfield is just a national, national treasure. And every building in it is just like a big smile that just says, I love you from the past. You know, you just can't not love it enough. So it's great, and we have lost things. We will continue, sadly, to lose things. But this is the famous Indian house in Deerfield, and, I, and I, they always, the story is that it survived the Indian, the, you know, the, the raid on Deerfield in 1704. But to me, just as big a story is the fact that something this ostentatious and grandiose even existed that far out in the backwoods in 1704. The house was built by the Sheldon family in the 1690s, and it's got everything going on. You know, two stories, large center chimney. Look at these big ornamental brackets, and if you go to Memorial Hall in Deerfield, you see about half the house. I think they wound up preserving a lot of the pieces of it, but the door certainly is intact. And the region also produced these so-called sal the salt box. While not unique to this region, was a conspicuous everywhere. And uh, here in Hatfield, you've got them. The set classic center chimney sa salt box, where you basically add a lean-to to the back for the kitchen. And these rooms, these houses can be of various size, but they, oh, the three of these are about the same size. They also typically have the corner door that leads right into the big family room that was kind of actually the main way people came and went. But there's you know, an elegance and symmetry and style to them. This one from uh, Springfield, I believe, is from the 1690s. Uh, this one, not that different really from East Windsor Hill, Connecticut from the 1750s. And I would say from 1680 to about 1770, for almost 100 years, uh, they were building houses like this. They may have literally been the most common large house form in the Connecticut Valley, but they're not the most famous. These ones are, the ones that were even bigger and that had these really ornate uh, Connecticut Valley scroll pedimented doorways. Uh, this is another object in Deerfield, but it was made by a Hatfield uh, artisan, Nehemiah Partridge. I think I got that right. Is I got his first name right? Nehemiah Partridge? Is that right? He was a Hatfield joiner, woodworker, designer, and he did, he traveled around building these things, and he did one in that for a family, the Williams family in Deerfield, and the door has been, is preserved. And you can see some of the churches 
had, were so, the church has often led the way architecturally. People, they build a new church, and the church has all kinds of fancy features, and now people want to build houses that kind of have those features. But you can see this is a, a picture of the long gone, but not before it was illustrated, uh, meeting house in East Windsor Hill. This house also in East Windsor Hill is um, the Ebenezer Grant House, and you can see that the, the, the layering up of moldings and the, again, the uh, uh, repetition of ornament and, and carving and these double doors with the raised panel work are amazing. Uh, this is your very superb example right here on the main street in Hatfield, and I think this is the greatest house I know. I just love this place. And is this a Dickinson house? It's right here in Hatfield. I forget, I'm not sure, I was in it once. But, you know, it's just on the uh, south end of the main street here, and it's a salt box, center chimney, but th th they've never seen another door quite like this. And look at the, the, the just sort of agitated fussiness of these moldings. I mean, it really is brilliant kind of design work. And this is just me playing with, um, playing with Photoshop. It never really looked like this, but I had fun coloring. This is, this is a detail. This is a detail from that door, and I was thinking, well, now just let's imagine all the different color possibilities. But who knows, because these things sometimes were painted, and we don't exactly know what they looked like originally. But if you look closely at these things, it's easier to, and easier to appreciate them. Then I mentioned Asher Benjamin in the 1790s. They get the, the styles keep changing, sort of country Palladian style that this guy Asher Benjamin made famous, but he was not the only one to uh, work in that style. This, uh, another architect named Lavius Fillmore who did churches in Middletown and uh, uh, Norwich, and this is an example in uh, uh, East Haddam, Connecticut before he moved north to uh, Vermont. And one of its distinguishing features, he had these acoustical domes on the interior of the buildings that were amazing. This is the plan for that kind of church out of Asher Benjamin's book. And uh, the other cool thing, I always say with old houses, there are three things. You obviously want to see the outside, but if you can get inside, the really, the elements, I mean, a a every inch of an old house, if it's authentic, is interesting. But staircases and fireplaces are really interesting. And staircases, there's a whole art to that. And the beautiful work that, that one can, that sometimes gets done. This is just an absolute national treasure. This is the Porter House in Hadley. It's the earliest, it's a two, double decker, two story staircase from 1702 or 1703, very early. Uh, Greenfield, the earliest circular staircase in the United States, actually a building designed by Asher Benjamin. So you get this sense that staircases are cool. You know, it's funny for an area so famous for its Puritan heritage, and it's just wonderful to be in this building, but we don't have any of these colonial meeting houses. Almost none of them have survived. Uh, uh, they, the, the colonial meeting houses were typically replaced either in the early national period or the Greek revival period or sometimes the Victorian period, but they don't generally survive. And if you want to see what every town in the Connecticut Valley had, Hatfield included and Waitley included, in the 18th century. You have to go to Rockingham, Vermont, not that far, but it's, and it's also in the Connecticut Valley because there you've got one of these Puritan plain style meeting houses with the box pews and the sounding board and these glorious pulpits that is still intact and is open to the public. So it's not a, serving as a, a church anymore, a meeting house, but it is an extraordinary thing. The gravestones, again, are as indigenous as a, a thumbprint. Uh, the flowers, the carving, sometimes you'll see some of the same ornamental work that you find in furniture on these uh, wonderful early uh, gravestones. And this is um, our examples from Westfield, Massachusetts, Farmington, Connecticut. And Long Meadow was the center of the best brownstone in the Connecticut Valley was from Long Meadow. There's geological differences one place to the next. And so some of the cemeteries are a little, you've got a great one here in Hatfield, by the way, and I've spent a lot of time in it. But you know, you look at this stuff and it's just magnificent. Uh, I once, uh, the director of the Wadsworth Athenaeum where I worked wanted to do a Picasso, an exhibit of Picasso's portraits. And I suggested, I said, that would be really cool if we could borrow some of 
Picasso portraits, and then show them side by side with some of these headshots from our gravestones. I just think that somehow Picasso would have liked that. I don't know. I certainly would. And, and you get really, I mean, just incredible things. And, you know, we see these details in furniture and architecture. There it is on a gravestone in Suffield. This is rare. It's a, uh, this guy was a deacon of his church, and he's showing the, the, the communion vessels illustrated in stone and different kinds of portraits. And, you know, it's just uh, fantastic stuff. And, and again, there are probably 50 to 70, I don't know the exact number, there are at least 50 known artists who did these kinds of stone carving work in the Connecticut Valley in the 18th and early 19th century. There's a lot of documentation. And the great thing about gravestones is they don't move around a lot. <laughs> and they usually carry their documentation on their back so you don't have to like, gee, who is this made for? Well, their name's right on it. So I'm, I'm a gravestone fanatic. I love them. And, and I like some of the ideas, some of the language. This is, this is my goal in life is to earn this. I'm working on it slowly. I want, at the end of my days, to be buried under a stone that describes me as exemplary, uncorrupt, and profound. <laughs> Not there yet, but working on it. It's good to have aspirations. Uh, this is the monument of Oliver Ellsworth, first U.S. Senate from Connecticut. Filial affection has erected this monument, and I love this from, all, I think from the 17th century, one of the few early ones that actually says something more than the vital statistics. Gone, but hope not lost. So that's, these are all worthy things to think. There aren't many portraits of the people who lived here in the 18th century. There are more in the early 19th century, but these are a few that have come down to us. Uh, merchants and magistrates, we didn't quite know what to do with paintings because uh, they, there weren't so many of them. But this is William Pynchon of Springfield, Ellery, Eliezer Wheelock Pomeroy of Hartford, and Judge Jabez Hamlin of Middletown. Uh, and, uh, and there are a lot of, again, the people whose portraits we have tend to be movers and shakers, people of privilege and position and authority. And they're, you know, the, the rich guys. And they're more men than women. But there are some women's portraits. These are all three ministers, and the ministers held an esteemed position in the, these communities. Enoch Huntington of Middletown, Richard Salter Storrs of um, Long Meadow, and Stephen Williams of Long Meadow, Massachusetts. And he's one of the ones that was 1704. His father was the minister in Deerfield, and they, they captured the children, and they took him up to Canada. He went all the way up to Canada, uh, and then was, uh, came home and became a minister. And so he made it. A uh, few women's portraits, some good ones. Mary Ledyard Seymour on the left. Mary Huntington from Middletown in the center. And Deborah Richmond uh, from Suffield, Connecticut on, on the right. And so uh, this is what we have. Uh, oh, and Oliver Ellsworth, I've already mentioned him. He was the uh, member of the first U.S. Senate, one of the authors of the U.S. Constitution from Windsor, Connecticut. That's a portrait by... Ralph Earl, and then in the center is Jonathan Dwight of Springfield with this wonderful tuft of hair growing out of his uh, cheek. We're pretty sure that was not artistic license, but exactly what the artist observed. Uh, and then uh, one of my heroes, really, this guy, um, Mason Fitch Cogswell, who was a Hartford doctor, who found, helped found the American School for the Deaf, and uh, there's a great story there. Not many landscapes. The, the earliest and most important that has come down to us is from Haddam, Connecticut. It's an overmantled picture, so it was painted over a fireplace. Um, this, you know, again, lots of buildings have been demolished. This Elisha Pitkin house in East Hartford was demolished to build a gas station in 1926 but they salvaged some of the interior woodwork. And most people did not live like this, but that's, somebody did, and more than one. And this is uh, uh, imitation, marbleizing, and paint, again, with a classical scene over the mantle. This is pretty heady, uptown stuff uh, for uh, rural western New England. Uh, the Alephala Williams House, an another minister in East Hartford, uh, that... Uh, that was demolished also long, long ago. But this window shutter with this Chinese decoration on it came from this house. And we can only imagine, you'll see in a moment, that perhaps the whole parlor was that way. This is an architectural fragment on display at Historic Deerfield that shows, uh, it's, this isn't the greatest slide, but it shows the use 
of uh, color in the exterior treatment. So we, you know, we're learning things all the time about how these houses originally looked. This is a house that was demolished in the 19th century. It was in Windsor, Connecticut, but the town historian notes that inside the house, over the mantel, was a mural illustrating the raid on Deerfield, which is kind of an incredible idea. That has not survived, but there, it is described in the idea that somebody in Windsor, Connecticut, and the point being is that this region was one. These families were all intermarried. There was lots of communication and trade back and forth. And after uh, uh, the King Philip's War, it wasn't really the people from Boston that rode into the rescue. It was the people from Hartford and lower in the Connecticut Valley that did. And so there has always been this economic and cultural sense of uh, communal identity here. Uh, Timothy Loomis, I'm going to try to speed this up. We got a late start. Best documented furniture maker, woodworker in 18th century America, not only just in the Connecticut Valley. The Loomis Chafee School in Windsor has all his practice books, his ledgers, his business records. And we know a lot from that. He made this clock case, this table, this chest. Uh, we know from him, as just that we know other ways, but is an example that do documents that people, that furniture makers and woodworkers in this period. 95% of his clients, the people he did work for, because we know because of the account book, were neighbors. These people, most of this kind of business was strictly within a town and sometimes within a neighborhood within a town. The only things, the only things he sold to someone who did not live in Windsor were people who were re related to him and then only, you know, maybe one town away. So all of these industries were very, very local. He built this house. Woodworkers who made furniture in the winter would sometimes get contracts to build. This was for the minister in uh, um, in Windsor, Connecticut, and, uh, and he was actually specialized in, in these really great staircases. Um, he trained, one of his apprentices became an architect with a capital A. His name was Thomas Hayden, and the earliest architectural drawings we have showing the use of that kind of uh, uh, sort of premeditated approach to construction and building uh, were the work of this Thomas Hayden. Uh, interesting things, this is the oldest object that was in the exhibit. It's from the 16th century. It was made in the 1580s. And it came over here from England with the Loomis family and has never been off the property they settled in 1639. When the family donated their land and farmed to create Loomis Chafee School, they also gave them the old Loomis family homestead, which is a veritable archaeological site loaded with artifacts that have never really been properly studied. But that was an iron back. It would go in a fireplace, and it was both ornamental and uh, and practical. Uh, this is the Middletown Seth Wetmore house painted in tears. I think probably arguably the greatest painted room in America and it again is suggestive of what was possible. I love the interior of this corner cupboard. I mean it's this is and it, again these are miracles of survival. They, actually there were miracles in the first place just getting made. I don't think one household in a thousand in the Connecticut Valley stepped it up to this degree but the fact that it's saved and preserved is sort of miraculous, and that is from Middletown. Uh, as I say, just in, in my own work in the aftermath, after the Great River exhibit, you know, uh, my interest in the Connecticut Valley, I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction, it expanded into other periods and other things. I got involved with the restoration of the ancient burying ground in Hartford. We, we raised a million dollars to do the most comprehensive state of the art restoration work. Uh, at least in brownstone that had ever been done. This was in the 1980s, and the Ancient Bearing Ground Association still exists. And, and uh, you know, there have been other things. In the early 90s, we did a, a, a conference and an exhibition uh, on Hadley Chess that, that was at Memorial Hall in Deerfield and at Wadsworth Athenaeum, and actually it toured to New York City and got written up in the New York Times, la-di-da. And we had a conference. It was awesome. It, we had 400 people attend this conference on um, the title of it was Diver Diversity and Innovation in American Regional Furniture. So it was kind of a send up for uh, the Connecticut Valley. And 
I don't know whether that's Hatfield or not, but look what made it on the cover. I think it is, let's get, I'm going to say it is Hatfield, a uh, detail from a Hatfield chest. And there were lots of essays and books. And so, you know, continue to dabble with it. The, the greatest object, and I think if it was sold on the market, it would bring the most money of any piece of furniture ever produced in the Connecticut Valley, was not in the Great River exhibit. Because at the time of that exhibit, it looked horrible. And it had 10 layers of filth and dirt and grunge on it. But when we doubled back in the 90s, we knew about it. We'd been frustrated about it. And, and we uh, persuaded the Fidelity Mutual Fund Foundation uh, to uh, pony up the $25,000 it cost to clean this. That's a lot of money, even now. It certainly was in 1993. And it was the before and after was astonishing. And uh, this is the Hannah Barnard cupboard from Hadley, not far away at all, and is arguably the single most valuable, greatest object. It's at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. We gotta send a little SWAT team out there to steal it in the night or something, I don't know. It doesn't belong there, they don't even care. They don't even know what it is. But we had it, we had it for a few months and it was really, really great. And um, uh, uh, Laurel Ulrich, who subsequently became famous, she won a MacArthur Genius Award, and she's one of the great women historic, historians of, colonial, of, of women in colonial America and other topics. She teaches at Harvard, but she wasn't as much of a big shot when we asked her to keynote this conference, which she agreed to do, and it, the conference did not make her a big shot. She is a big shot. She's brilliant, and it was just a thrilling episode. I moved into the 19th century, and again, in some ways, the, the industrial age is a bigger story for this region than even uh, the colonial stuff. And I did an exhibition on Sam and Elizabeth Colt uh, that uh, spawned a, kind of created the climate of opinion. We're in Hartford on this long march trying to get a national park in Coltsville. The National Park Service wants it. The people at the Springfield Armory are ecstatic. They can't wait because it'll connect some dots and make the region more of that industrial story. But really, the Connecticut Valley was the birthplace of the high-tech industrial age and the place that perfected the technologies that made everything from guns and typewriters and sewing machines and eventually uh, uh, automobiles, and this was a revolution in the world of work that unfolded right in our backyards and touched every place. Greenfield, Amherst, Springfield, of course, it, Windsor, Vermont, all the way down to Middletown and New Haven. It really was a regional story, and these, these guns are, people love them, and that's Sam. And his wife, when he died, he left her um, 400 million, which was real money in those days, it still is. She was the richest woman in America, and she, did, she gave it all away. Uh, sadly for her, it's a story for another evening, she, none of her children lived to adulthood, uh, or they lived beyond her. Her one son shown here did live to adult, adulthood, but predeceased her. But she left uh, an endowment and a building and a collection, and the, the Colt family is so well documented. There is no famous industrialist in, in America for whom more of the artifacts and stuff and archival material. So the potential to do something big with this, if we ever get this national park thing off the ground, is enormous. Places like Chicopee and Springfield, uh, big, big deal. The machine tool industry, these may not be beautiful antiques in a sense, but they are fascinating. And if any of you have not been to the American Precision Museum in Windsor, Vermont, that is a run, don't walk experience. It's just a magnificent thing. And it's, it's better than the Smithsonian at what they do. Smithsonian does what they do too with all of our money. But with their own money in Little Windsor, Vermont, they do a better job. And it is absolutely a thrilling place to visit up in uh, Windsor, Vermont. Chicopee has never really told this story. But to me, this is the coolest thing that the Ames Manufacturing Company made machine tools, they made guns, they made cannons during the Civil War. And after the Civil War, they converted their foundry to manufacture what? Art, statuary, sculpture. Augustus St. Gaudens, the Puritan, famous statue in the, uh, near the uh, uh, quadrangle in Springfield, uh, was cast in a foundry in Chicopee. And that foundry, the building where they did that, 
doesn't even have a marker on it, but it still stands. And it's just to me, I just get goosebumps thinking about all this stuff and going there. And you know, again, we made again machine tools and bicycles. I hope you've also been to the uh, uh, new history centers. Not that new; it's four or five years old now. It's Springfield. The Springfield Museums have developed a state-of-the-art history museum that is really outstanding, and they've got lots of stuff. Uh, uh, bicycles and motorcycles, the Indian motorcycles were made there and automobiles, but lots of other things they show and they present things well. Uh, typewriters, young people today don't, maybe they don't even know what those were. Telephone, I watched somebody on the Today Show, they had a little clip of five year olds looking at a telephone trying to figure out what it was. <laughs> so the world changes. But, and you know, even today, United Technologies, Aerospace, we're still in it. This is the national park we're trying to create. This is the Springfield Armory that we've already got. Um, they do a decent job. I'd love to see, I yeah, I'm, like guns, I'm interested in guns, but I think the social part of this story is even more important. And it's, it's you know, there are a lot of elements of this story that, 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 that we, we need to tell and we need to know a little bit better. And every town had these little machine shops, some big, some small. This machine-based manufacturing was really the great story of this age. Institutions, progressive education, uh, creating what today we might call a, a safety net or a, you know, the, the kind of institutionalization of humanitarian reform, a life learning culture and Western expansion. I mean, these are all things that this region was famous for. This is Dartmouth College, the American School for the Deaf, the Wadsworth Athenaeum, when that was founded in 1842, 99.9% .9 of males and 100% of females, I think this is correct, did not attend college. So th the Athenaeum was a library, it was an art gallery, the historical society there. It was a shrine to life learning. You didn't have Google and the internet. You went to the Athenaeum and it would enlarge your brain. At least that was, I think, the theory. And so these are kind of really great things that this region did. Um, the uh, tobacco, of course, and uh, religion and agriculture and, and, and maritime trade are also themes in our history. Um, I live, literally my backyard in Enfield is, uh, has been a tobacco, some years they, they, they grow tobacco. And I, I think that in August when they're harvesting tobacco that it is the most spiritual thing and if you ever get a chance, you probably everyone in Hatfield has done this, but to be downwind on the right end of a tobacco shed when the wind is pouring through one end and that waft of smell and scent is sort of enveloping you, it's magic. And the scent, the look, the tradition, and you know, we have a couple weeks a year where the, 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 the tractors are coming and going like crazy and they're harvesting this stuff and hanging it. And to me, that is a annual rhythm that has been with us for th since the 18th century. And it is kind of amazing that it still endures. Uh, the Connecticut River Valley was the birthplace in many ways of the antiques industry. And that's partly because you had rich urban bankers and insurance people living, many cases, within practically walking distance of farms that hadn't changed ownership and would still been in. This is how the Hadley chest got discovered, is one of these bankers was up prowling around Hadley looking for loot, and he literally found a Hadley chest on somebody's back porch, offered them some money for it, and off it went. That wasn't always the case, but there was a lot of that going on. And I think it's partly why George Sheldon in Deerfield was able to create this magnificent shrine to local history and why the Henry and Helen Flint uh, sort of got the bug looking at Deerfield and looking at what he'd done and why we've got all this great stuff. The Connecticut Valley from New Haven to Deerfield has the fourth largest concentration of early American artifacts in the country. That's after New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and maybe Williamsburg has more, but I don't think so. If you go to see what they've got at Yale and Deerfield and all these places, we have an abundance, and we haven't always promoted that fact. I think the uh, cities are, it, it, it is heartbreaking to me to see what has happened to our cities because our Connecticut Valley cities were like the crown jewels of American civilization. 
Springfield was an aspirational place. If you lived in Hatfield in 1925 and you were going into Springfield, you'd kind of dress up and you'd feel like, you know, you were going not maybe quite to Oz, but, you know, a special place. And, you know, our cities are struggling. Who knows where that will end up? But you don't have to look hard to see the evidence of their grandeur and glory, what they were and what they achieved. And this is Hartford, and it's just, you know, I love it. And I think... Um, uh, scene, uh, um, uh, art, uh, the, the, then, uh, again, in the 19th century, after the Great River period, there were artists, I mentioned earlier, that, that came, Thomas Cole and others, uh, Alvin Fisher, this is, uh, I always love this, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, about 15, 20 years ago, produced this grand tome, it was like a definitive book and a major exhibition on the Hudson River School of Artists, and on the cover of that book was this view of the Connecticut River in Northampton. I'm not even, I'm not even sure they understood the <laughs> slight irony of that, but you know, to go up to Skinner State Park, and I, man, that's just the like coolest thing. I go up there, we had our, our children, we had our birthday parties for our kids, and you go up there with the hibachis and chicken, and come on, life doesn't, if life gets better than that, I don't need it. Uh, the, the, the American Impressionists found this region exciting and alluring. Willard Metcalf on the left, his scene of Deerfield, Everett Warner of Old Lyme, illustrating these houses of worship, and a great deal more in different seasons, different light, different weather conditions. Uh, Paul Sample and Harriet Loomis, who did a lot, she was from Springfield, and she did a lot of, they got a lot of her work at the Springfield Art Museum, and she was, again, one of these sort of impressionist era artists. Uh, the WPA in the 1930s, these murals um, that depict sense of place, past, uh, on the left is, on the upper one is Thompsonville, Connecticut. Lower left is the Abnakis in Bellows Falls. And on the right is a farmer in Hadley, I guess. Then just the scenic splendor of it. To really appreciate a place, you have to sort of not just get out of the museums, <laughs> of course, a little bit, and just enjoy and soak up the visual beauty of the physical setting and its distinctive features. The river itself being the most conspicuous of those features. Uh, rocks, the brownstone that we've seen in the gravestones and the foundations of houses. That was just an outcropping right on I-91 of this indigenous uh, material. Uh, the canals, both the Hadley Canal and the, uh, this is the Windsor Locks uh, Canal and the waterways, and just, you know, the spring floods, and just this idea of this 400-mile-long body of fresh water. Boy, they're going to be killing each other out west before this is through. Water is going to be the gold of the 21st century. I think it already is to some degree, but don't be surprised when the day comes that it turns out that what we got here, just because of all that abundance of fresh water, is a huge uh, natural and economic advantage. The tobacco, which we've already referred to, is uh, part of our culture. Uh, urban river fronts, they do a nice job. You know, again, cities are trying, and there are beautiful features. I love Springfield, and I love Hartford, but they, it's not always easy. Uh, again, water and recreation, this is kind of cool down in uh, 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 Lyme, Connecticut. There are a few places, I've done a lot of boating on the Connecticut River, and there are places where you have outcrops of rock that go right into the, the river where you can have fun. And these are just some of our little scenic vistas. The one on the left is uh, half a mile from my house. I visit that site a hundred times a year. And it's, it's Kings Island Overlook in Enfield, and it's just you know, I mean, if I lived in Yosemite, I suppose that would be a little more exciting, but not much. Uh, Mount Holyoke, the Gillette Castle, these are pretty cool things, and these are pictures taken from the water. Look at those. Is that a, is that a small mouth or a big mouth bass? I forget what that is. It's big. All I know is a big fish. And uh, Lord's Cove down the estuary, the Long Island Sound. And then really our museums and institutions, Organizations like the Hatfield and Waitley Historical Society do the heavy lifting of keeping this stuff alive. We as a society aren't doing enough to support them and what is, would be possible in terms of education and civic attachment if we could build a bridge 
that was mutually beneficial between historical societies like yours and the way our kids learn in the schools, it would change lives and it would change communities in the most positive way imaginable. And that's the Connecticut River Museum, the Florence Griswold Museum. I love the Farm Museum in Hadley. It's just, I would go there every year. I should, uh, sometimes I go and it's closed. But I, I always go by there once a year and I probably step inside once every few years and I just love it. The upper right is the Glastonbury Historical Society. Every town's got a slightly different story. No two of these community-based historical organizations are even remotely alike. They are the window into the soul of your community's narrative and they are precious and irreplaceable. You know, Porter Phelps Huntington, the General Mansfield House in, in, in Middletown, and then this is one of the properties I ran in Hartford. It was the Butler McCook House which is the, I call it the best documented house in America. I, until somebody challenges me or proves otherwise, I'm going to stick to my story. Staden was built in 1789, but with, there's tons of archival material, letters. They never threw, these people had the worst mental illness of pack rat, you don't throw anything away. It was the most severe case I've ever seen. I mean, if they bought a box of Kleenex, the receipt is still in that house. So just an archaeological gold mine and with lots of artifacts. Here, this is just mind-blowing. The Butler Tavern was across the street. It was demolished in 1856. It was built in the 17th century. When they demolished the Butler Tavern, the family deconstructed the staircase and stored it in the basement of their new house. Uh, you know, so there's a 17th century the pieces of a 17th century staircase in the basement, but thousands and thousands of artifacts, a paper trail going back to 1704, and I have uh, often wondered, it's actually interesting, the Indian house in Deerfield was built by a Sheldon from Hartford, and after the Indian house, after the stuff hit the fan in uh, Deerfield, I think at least one of those Sheldons skedaddled back to Hartford, that made sense. So again, that sense of connectivity, and there were many, this is called the Butler McCook house, but there were more Sheldon lineage in that family line there than any other name. So I often wonder if the Sheldons don't have a genetic predisposition to antiquarianism because there, there are a lot of them around. This is another house I operated, the, the Suffield Phelps Hathaway house has an attic. It's just incredible. This is probably the greatest 18th century house in the Connecticut Valley. It's got five rooms with these incredible French wallpapers brought in in the 1790s. And this guy was like the richest guy, and he just built this big mansion in Suffield. And it is open to the public, but the thing that made my head explode is the attic. There are 5,000 objects. You talk about Yankee frugality. You need a box filled with little scraps of tin, because you never know when you'll need one. And there were 20 broken chamber pots. But you know what? It's an amazing archaeological site. There are artifacts from the 18th century, and not a single thing has been added since World War I. And two generations, before it became a museum, there were two generations of families that owned this house and moved everything out and moved their stuff in and then moved everything out and moved another person's stuff. But in both cases, they just looked at the attic and said, tired, can't do it, and left it. So it is, to me, it's the greatest quintessential New England attic, an incredible time capsule, and a miracle of survival. Then we just got our great art museums, the Morgan Memorial Wing of the Wadsworth Athenaeum. I love George Walter, Vincent Smith, and his wife, Belle, and what they did in Springfield. George Sheldon, I based my life on his teachings. This guy was a genius, and he did, he created, more than anyone else, the, the aura and mythology and sense of purpose that made the town of Deerfield what it is. I mean, Deerfield Academy existed before his time a little bit, but, but it really was George Sheldon's more than almost, I mean, there are lots of contributors to this narrative, but this guy was the bomb. I mean, I just, I love George Sheldon. And, and, and the Frary Tavern there was one of the properties that actually belonged, I think it was part of the Memorial Hall at one point, now part of historic Deerfield, but Deerfield's got all these moving parts, and it's really, really cool. And then here you are. You know, this is, I just, I love, and I now, this may literally have been a contributing factor. I have a bumper sticker on my car that says, I break for historic libraries. And I have now been in about 400 of them. 
In fact, I have a program I do about historic libraries. It's loads of fun. And uh, I just keep going. And I, this wasn't the first one. I'd seen some in Vermont. But this was, to me, classic. You know, when I first was doing the research 30 years ago on this and came to the Hatfield Historical Society, because there's a sign that says it's not just a library. It's also a museum. But you had to come Friday night or get an appointment. So I did. And that's when we found the chair and a few other things. But you know, I know Kathy wants, and there's talk around town about maybe moving the stuff out and to having a bigger and better facility. All of that would be good, but there's nothing deficient in this. The only thing missing from this, you got two things of astonishing excellence, the collections and her passion for it. The only thing you do is throw a little money in the mix and stir, and it will change the course of history. I mean that. And I just, and I love this. I don't know that there's another one. This is from Hartford. My wife, who runs the Windsor Historical Society, is, is going to try to plunder the state of Connecticut and Massachusetts when they sued the cigarette companies uh, for uh, just being hateful sinners or whatever they sued them for. They got millions of dollars from the cigarette companies that they immediately added to their little slush funds, even though they said right from the outset that they were going to use some of that money to educate people about the, the, the horrors of tobacco. And so my wife is thinking, look, let's see if we can out call them out on this and get them to throw a little money our way to do something around the tobacco theme with our Windsor Historical Society. Because tobacco is an industry there too. And, and yet, here, here we are in Hatfield. I find that wonderful little program. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, I love, I'm embarrassed. I promise I'm going to fix it this summer because I now know where to call. I need to see the Waitley Historical Society. I will say that I know Waitley, and I, I always think of Waitley when I go to Storalton because they took away your fantastic brick schoolhouse that was from Waitley that is at Storoton Village. But the pottery story we know, and it's great stuff. I actually, this is a wonderful painting, impressionist painting by Lester Stevens that is in the Hatfield Library. I took that picture, so it's proof I was there. Uh, and uh, my, for many, many years, my parents, who are now in their late 80s and don't like driving to Connecticut anymore, but when we, they would come every year for Thanksgiving, and we always went to the Waitley Inn, and year after year after year. And I just think it's a, I love it. They move so many turkey dinners. The speed, the efficiency, they will do five seatings in one day. It is, to me, an astonishing act of organizational skill. And that is a great little wonderful place. I love the Waitley in. So that's it. This is pretty much where it ends. Uh, again, we keep at it. The other thing that I just will mention in uh, closing again, if anybody wants one of those books, I, I got them in the back. The other thing is, uh, I do a lot. Some of you may be involved. Others probably aren't. But I think social media, Facebook, and, and some of these things is actually really useful. And I've got two Facebook sites that I play with. One is called uh, Historic Springfield and the Pioneer Valley, and it, you know, like I posted that I was going to be here tonight, and other things, things that are just happening, things that are discovering. If I visit the Wait Waitley Historical Society, when I visit the Waitley Historical Society, I'll write about it. It's kind of like a blog. And then this Housing Our History, which is about historical societies and community-based museums. So I went way over, and we got a late start, so you've missed everything you plan to watch on TV. But thank you, and there's a cake in the next room. Thanks.